I will sue and I will go public. You point your finger at me, I point my finger at you. We are gonna grind you down, man. We are sand in the gears. I hate you. Do you understand that? Loud and clear. Good. Roman sure. is an absolutely fascinating character. He really okay. is. And you have also played him brilliantly. Well, thanks. You're welcome. Sorry, we're out of time. That's perfect. Let's end on the high note. <laughs> That's it. Thank you. Good night. That's it. Wow. <laughs> thanks for taking the time to say that. <laughs> Karen, how do you manage to make Roman so disturbing, yet um, so vulnerable at the same time. A lot of that that's in the writing that they see. I think that there's, um, it's really kind of amazing about the show is right at the beginning, it felt like, you know, we were given this great template, this pilot, but you know, there was room for us to sort of fill in our own gaps. Uh, I remember not even like asking questions. I just sort of made decisions for myself in terms of Roman's like backstory of the kind of thing person he was. and waiting to sort of be corrected but between the pilot and then them writing episodes like two and three it seemed that they had paying pretty close attention to what the actors had done with the material that jesse gave us and started writing a bit toward it and the biggest example of that i would say is uh connor uh, i think uh, apparently they're publishing the scripts like they're, they're coming up but if you look at the pilot script connor is a pretty blank slate and could have just been the older brother who's around occasionally, normal guy. And Alan came in with something I did not see on the page at all. And this very eccentric, odd man, almost kind of spooky to be around. And that was just something Alan brought. And by the time we got about a year later, I was like, oh, this is, this is Connor now. It's different. They have Alan's voice now and they have whatever Alan was doing, which was weird, uh, they started writing it too. Uh, so he really helped create that character, I think, with the writers. So they started doing that with my voice and with everyone else's. So it was sort of like discovering it together. And I always felt like I had a voice if something felt off. And I could always I could always speak up. Uh, and it was never really a fight. I could just say, I actually don't think uh, Roman would do that. Or Although, really lucky uh, in that, and I told Jesse this like last year, I think, uh, I said whenever there would, I would have an issue when like the first script would come, I would mm -hmm. keep it to myself because it's a table redraft and then we'll get the official draft later. A lot of those corrections would be made and sometimes the night before we're about to do the scene and I have an issue with it because I don't think Roman would do it, we would get a rewrite at like 1 a.m. and he caught it himself and would fix wow. it so I wouldn't even have to say it. There was It was so like synced up. Like he would look at it and be like, hmm, perhaps with a more focused eye, Roman wouldn't do that and I didn't have to. And if I did, uh, he would sometimes give a counter argument as to why he thought Roman would do something, uh, but he wanted to hear me out and we would usually come to an agreement right then and there. Sometimes we would sort of try both or try his or try mine and you know whatever and find it. There's one this year that I can't talk about mm -hmm. where it was a red flag from the beginning that they had Roman just like walking away from something that I didn't think he would walk away from and I brought it up and I brought it up and then Jesse like put it in the script, which was really nice. He like, he, mm -hmm. he changed his mind in the script and I said, but do you want both? And he goes, I'm not sure yet. I put yours in just because that makes sense to you. So we'll, we'll know on the day if that's gonna be something you do. And we tried my way and he didn't want, he, he said if that to him, that felt true for Roman to do. And so by putting in the script and seeing it, he was like, that's what we're gonna do. And then we actually took it one step further where I asked my lot, actually, I think I wanna do something else. Can we film both versions? Uh, so we filmed the way that I, it's it's hard to talk about without being specific, but we filmed yeah, the way- Yeah, I don't want I, you to spoil it. <laughs> I know, but we filmed the way that I had pitched. I said, which one do you wanna do first? The, the scripted or the one that my idea? And he goes, just let's do your idea because it's easy to just sort of remove you from it later. So we did it and we did it like two or three times. And I said, do you wanna remove? He goes, actually, I talked to Jesse and I think we think that this is, great, this is what Roman would do. And it was really nice to be like, that wasn't in the script, it just felt like, instead of keeping it myself going, mm, in my gut I really feel like I would do this, but the script says not to. I just spoke up and they said, try it. And then they saw it and went, yeah, that is what Roman would do. That's, a, that's like an amazing thing you just don't get. 
No, no, no. It's huge when an yeah. actor has that kind of voice and as well as development of a character and is allowed to express that behind the scenes. And not. And it's just not just like a certain like tier people. I think like, you know, when a day an actor comes in for a day, if they have a question, they speak up like they they want to collaborate with every actor that's in. It's not like a you're 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 this character. You don't get to speak. It's like everyone. We're all we're all here trying to make this thing better. And it's he I, he must know that he's a very talented writer and that he, he 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 must know that but there's no ego involved it's not yeah i wrote this brilliant thing you have to make it work your job is to make my words work it's like oh that's interesting why wouldn't you he wants to hear that you know the keep keep the keep the real everybody you know we're all working on this thing together it's very like handmade it's his but he's like he doesn't have an ego he goes help me i'm making this thing help me Absolutely. And you've made this character your own. In fact, just the trajectory of Roman from the season three season finale to mm -hmm. all of the scenes and the trailers and things that we've seen for season four, he's mm -hmm. gone through a lot. <laughs> yeah, there's a there's a lot. So where where is he at the start of season four? Where is he with his siblings? And what is his relationship going to be now with Jerry? Yeah, I know. With the, with Jerry, I, I, you know, I don't know. Because I've never, I don't even know what it has been in the first place. I still haven't quite figured out what that is. It makes sense in my belly, but I don't really know what that is. Um, and then in terms of, like, the siblings, I think it's actually something close to healthy for once. You know, I think we've been sort of competing with each other and just been sort of under dad's you know, spell a bit because we love each other, but have no means to sort of express that or show that with each other. We're not going to like get together and hang out. Like we, we always needed the business to hang out with each other. I think Roman doesn't really have anyone else. I think he has his siblings mm -hmm. and the people he works with. I don't think they're like friends. He doesn't have a, a partner. He does, there's nobody else. So he needs the business in order to have relationships with people, including the ones he loves. So when he gets cut out, he at least gets cut out with his siblings. And it's like, well, we have each other, but we can't just hang out. We need something. So we form a, a, a business together. We're putting this thing together. Just, I, I think, yeah, it's, I think it's a good idea. And it's, it's good to, you know, have our own business and be our own people and be separate from dad. But I think it's more so that for Roman anyway, it's more like, so I can keep hanging out with you guys and we can have a relationship because otherwise if we don't have anything, we're never going to see each other. If we have our own business and it's successful, we do that. There's potential to have a relationship with dad now that we're not working for him. We can actually like, I think for Roman anyway, I, I don't know if the siblings feel the same way. It's like, yeah, dad hurt us. But also, you know, I think I want to, I'd like to get to a place where I'm seeing him on his birthday or, you know, Thanksgiving and stuff. I think I'd like get, to get back to hanging out with dad. And if we have our own business, then maybe we can get together and have a scotch and talk about our, uh, our, our, our different companies and ask for advice here and there and have, you know. Give me one thought on uh, this new season without Jerry, who's basically pushed herself away from you or your character at the end of season three. Give me one thought on what that did to Roman. I think in that moment, Roman was hurt by Jerry, but also she's always going to make the practical choice, the right business decision. And I think that's right for her. She says it. So I think he understands. I think when we start this, it's a couple months later. And I think it's like, I feel like it's, I feel anyway, no actual hard feelings toward her. I think whatever that thing is he has, has had for her, he still has. I don't think it's like a betrayal. It's like a, well, you know, we came after dad and we lost and you pick the side because you pick the right side because it's best for you that makes sense he's on the floor tom explain to me what he's doing he's moseying terrifyingly moseying it's like if santa claus was a hitman i love this show i love cousin greg <laughs> Why? No. Why do you like him? Why do you love him? I would like to hear from you because I'm trying to figure it out still. Like, why do you, you tell me? Well, I personally think, and you've kind of alluded to this a little bit. I think we might be watching the best villain origin story of all time. <laughs> like, I think he's been nice and observant and everything from the outside for so long. But I really feel this season that 
Greg is going to really let loose. Now, am I wrong? Can you tell me? I cannot tell you. Uh, <laughs> that is for sure. But I like your theory. I like your theory a lot. Uh, I think when it's kind of human nature, right? When somebody's like bullied or punished, you know, or whatever, shamed enough, like eventually they're going to come for you. So let's let's see what happens. He's he's been hazed a lot. Yes, he has. OK, well, can you answer this? Um, what has excited you the most about playing this version of Greg? It's really fun. It's been fun to just grow him, grow his maturity and and sort of chip away at his goodness over time. That morality that he had in the first season. And so it feels like this was an opportunity for us to really like I personally wanted him to have like a sharp haircut and nice bespoke suits mm -hmm. and crisp shirts that fit me really well and and you know good shoes and nice watches that cost a lot of money and I think all that stuff it's a nice way to to kick it off there's been about three months maybe between the end of season three and and the beginning of season four um, and he's so confident being on the Logan side so like clearly that uh that it felt right to just you know what would logan want him to look like how you know you have to represent the logan side so i mm -hmm. can't be i have to show up and be somebody that that he wants to be next to so yeah so that was that was fun and then and you'll see sort of how he is as a man this year so it sounds like this season it's really he cares <clears throat> way more about what logan thinks than tom yeah, I think so. I mean, I think he's got t his relationship with Tom already. I th mm -hmm. If you're close to Logan, that's that's the thing you're drawn towards the most. Uh, I think Greg knows Tom is going to punish him and and um, and keep him below him in the pecking order, uh, but. But I think Logan, being close to Logan, endearing himself to Logan is always the goal. But he thinks that, and then Tom continues to be a pain in the ass for Greg. <laughs> of course, because, yeah. you know, the disgusting brothers. They have to. <laughs> <laughs> who, who He's the disgusting older brother. Yeah. <laughs> who came up with that, by the way? And how did you find the right way to, like, say it? Is that the writers or was that you? That is the writers. Okay. That would that would be a crazy improv to bring in to the show. Um, <laughs> I wish I had. But uh, yeah, that was all them. Looking back, what do you think is the worst <clears throat> thing that Greg has done on the show? And what do you think is the worst thing Greg had done to him on the show? The worst thing that Greg has done on the show is try to sue Greenpeace. I guess that's- a, That was epic. <laughs> that's a pretty horrible thing to do. And the worst thing that's happened to Greg is probably getting thrown in the, the snow and slapped around by Tom at the end of season one. I think yeah, that, that's that worse horrible. physical abuse than the water bottles getting thrown at him. But those, yeah, those, those two, that's real physical harm. So what would it look like if Greg does like get Logan's eye and become the successor? What would be the first thing he would do? You know, he's he probably would try to do Logan-y things and feel kind of fake or something. But I th maybe he's just like a really good CEO and like a great guy. I don't know. These are not, not, not good theories. I'm not, not liking any of these theories. <laughs> You can scratch all this. This is none of these are good. That's you should ask Jesse. Please ask Jesse. I, well, I, I don't can't think do he, it. I don't think Greg would be able to do any of this without Tom. I don't think he'd be a good leader if Tom was still there because Tom would be vying for uh, power, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Tom would be pulling a lot. Tom would probably try and get Greg assassinated uh, if if uh, Greg was the CEO and not him. So. OK, so let's say they, that he isn't the successor, but let's say Tom and Greg get their own spinoff show. Would it be mm. a rival company? You know, that's a good that would be a good way to do it. 
they could they could start their own company. I don't know where if anyone would give them money to start a company, but it'd be you know be fun to watch those guys in like a an indie movie, like a road trip movie through you know Russia. Oh my uh, god, <laughs> that would be insane. So yeah. okay. I know you can't tell us what Greg does in season four. Can you give us a hint as to what Greg observes about each sibling this season? Because in the last season, Kendall, Shiv, and Roman basically got their butts handed to them. Does Greg in proximity to them, is he their antagonist now? Or does he still try to is he still trying to be on recon and get information out of everybody? I think Greg is never fully loyal to any side. So um, do with that what you will. I, I th yeah, I think he he's always looking for the best card to play, the best um, side to be on. And I think he's always gathering data and trying to, to, to be a little schemey uh, in all ways. So, so he's, he's, not, he's, he's never fully against anyone, I don't think. Gotcha. You have made this character like cousin Greg is now like an icon and go down in history, this character that you have created. So That's very kind. You're very welcome. What does it what did it feel like on the last day of shooting? Yeah, the last day. Last day was really weird because it felt it felt good that I had really good last. They were my last scenes story wise. So it felt really good to finish with that. And then I thought I was just gonna be like, cool, thanks everybody, you know, see you at the premiere. And then when we all wrapped, you know, they call your names out and the whole crew claps and everything. I got really emotional and, and you know, you look around and you just think about how many years I've been working with this person and how great they are at their job and how much they've, I've learned from them. and gone through with them and, you know, needed them. It's, you know, you kind of like w wardrobe and props and, and uh, all, you know, to the director and Jesse, it's like you need help from all these people in order to do your job well. And, um, and so it's pretty amazing what everyone puts into this life, you know, making TV, making movies, you know, people like, don't get to see their families when we travel to Croatia or, or Norway. They don't get to be with their kid. You know, COVID season was really hard for, for um, the crew and everybody. So I think that I felt a, a lot of gratitude and, and, um, and just, yeah, it's kind of, it was unbelievable to feel like I'm never going to see this group again. I'll probably see a lot of these people in other jobs separately, but this group is, is done. So... <laughs> It was pretty, yeah, felt really big all of a sudden. Everything I try to do, people turn against me. I'm a hundred feet tall. These people are pygmies. The pilot of Succession began with Logan's 80th birthday party and the mm. premiere for Succession's final season also begins with a birthday party for Logan. This time though, with the exception of Connor, his children aren't there. How does that affect him? Oh, he's very sad about it. He would like his kids to be there, but his kids are so recalcitrant that they cannot step up to the plate. And uh, it's a source of great sadness for Logan, you know? That's why we see him where he meets the one person who's been most, apart from Carrie, his new love, or whatever her relationship is, is, uh, is Colin, you know, his constancy over the, the whole four series. And he goes, you know, you're my best pal. You're the person, you know, and that's a, it's such a sad state. It's a wonderful acknowledgement, though, of, of that character because of his, his constancy. He's never made, he doesn't make any demands. He's got no ulterior motives. He just does his job. And that's actually all that Logan wants. He wants people to do their job without all kinds of agendas at place or all kinds of, you know, futile ambitions at work. And that's the problem with the kids 
is they want something else. They need some kind of um, assurance of something, you know, that they, and without making any effort in terms of their responsibility. And, uh, so, and so they're kind of crippled by their own avarice, really. Mm. And he can see that. And he can understand it. He's not a fool. He understands how difficult it is for his children. It's like, you know, especially, I mean, you know, I'm an actor. My eldest son is an actor. And I know how difficult it is for him to have his father, who's quite a well-known actor. And he's a, my, my son, Alan, is a brilliant actor. And actually now he's at the age of 50, he's suddenly coming into his own in a wonderful way. But it's been a long haul for him and it's been difficult for him. So I know what that's like, what that parent child relationship is about. And these kids have just, they want to circumvent so much as um, I think it's a quote from Macbeth, vaulting ambition, which all leaps itself and falls on the other side. And then he, and then he talks about jumping the life to come. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's what they're doing. They want to jump the life to come. They don't want to experience their responsibility. They want all on a plate. And he just says, it ain't like that. You got to understand it's hard work. It's a lonely business. You know, when you have a vision of an empire, even though it is the antithesis of any empire I believe in, mm -hmm. uh, but it's still his empire and he has to be given credence for that and the kids ain't doing it well and he says that you know i love you all but you're just not serious people not serious people absolutely well spotted that that's one of the key things you're not serious people and i think that's very true i think that's true and you know because he comes up for i mean they all they all love to hate logan i mean the audience of oh he's a brute oh you know do tell me to f off you know all that on a regular basis i get all the time could could you just tell me to f off please and i'll f off you know, <laughs> <laughs> you know it's, it's it's true so you've had people on the street that, actually walk up to you and ask you to say that to them all the time <laughs> all the time That's people come incredible. up to me they take out their their iphones and they point in my direction and say can you please tell me off and i go yeah that's the easiest thing in the world off <laughs> you have mentioned that the dinner with kendall from season three was one of your favorite scenes when he tells him life's not knights on horseback it's a number on a piece of paper it's yeah. a it's a fight for a knife in the mud what did that reveal to you about Logan? Well, it, 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 how tough it's been. Mm. You know, it is a fight for, you know, it, it doesn't have to always be like that, but that's been his experience. That's what he's gone through. And the kids don't, re I mean, kids, they don't realize what you as a parent have gone through. They don't realize the sacrifices that you've made in order to, be the person you are and create the family that you want you know and it's tough it's not easy and i think that that's that's logan that's where logan tells the truth it isn't knights on horseback it isn't you know somebody coming in and you know and wearing a lady's favor and claiming the day it ain't it's that's bollocks you know it's a tough tough business and that business, especially in the media business, is really, really tough. And then all the adherence stuff and the boat, you know, when he, 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 and the, and he finds out about this stuff. And he's an innocent look. And he said, I didn't know what was going on. I mean, that kind of stuff has never been, you know, I'm, I'm not into that. He's not, I mean, he's, he's had his affairs and he's, you know, he's uh, had his relationship with, with members of the opposite sex, but he's never gone into that sort of taking advantage of situations, but clearly that has happened. And, and actually there's, so that there is also something quite innocent about Logan too, at the same time. He's, there, he's not, he's not what he seems to be, you know? Now, will, any of the children be the successor or will it be greg will it be greg i don't know it's a bit like the um you know the pope deciding on the pope you know the smoke hasn't gone up the chimney yet <laughs> that's true and, I, and and the other thing about the pope is somebody's got to die for that to happen yeah exactly so. <laughs> you know, so, and uh, you know so we have to see what happens yeah. 
Succession, after four seasons, has had such a profound effect on pop culture. What does the series mean to you, looking back on it now? And what did, was the last day on set for you like? You know, the last day on the set was was difficult because, not for me, but for everybody else, you know, going, oh, this is the last day, oh, dear. And I just said, well, it's the last day on the set, you know. <laughs> I'll put it on, but, you know. I mean, I've had a long and great career. I've been, I think I'm one of the luckiest people ever to have the career that I've had, you know. I mean, really, the work that I've done over, I, you don't dwell on it, but you go, God, I played that, and I played that, and I go, oh, my God, I forgot I did that. You know, it's amazing. You look back, you go, thankful. <clears throat> and then when when you come to something like this show, I mean, it's certainly the icing on an incredible cake, you know, and you go, wow, you know, this part, this, I mean, as soon as it, as soon as the thing was pitched to me, I thought this is one of the great roles of all time. And I just have to keep my nose to the grindstone and make it work. And it's been a gift and a joy. And so I've, I've been very happy and I'm very grateful. I, I do, there are certain elements to where I, I, was, I was nicely anonymous before, you know, 2018. I was nicely anonymous. I mean, I was the guy that went, were you in, no, that wasn't you. Oh, were you, did you do, oh no, no, that wasn't, yeah, but didn't you, oh no, that was, that was who I was. But now, Logan Roy has s stolen my, you know, anonymity. <laughs> Well, I think you've done an incredible job. And no, I knew you as Stryker. I knew you as a lot of other characters, too. <laughs> um, well, that's what I'm, you know, that's what I'll go on to. Because, you know, it's only a stop along the way. And my view is, you know, we need to practice our craft. I don't understand the actor who only does one film a year or one job a year. And I go, when are you practicing? When are you doing? You know, I, I love the game. I love the job. I love every aspect of it, the voiceovers, the work. And I want to be practicing all the time. And I've been blessed. I'm very, I'm really very grateful for this last you know, few years. It's been a joy and it's been an honor to do. You cannot win. Your dad will wash you away. This is a chessboard. Are you tanking the deal? And every move is crucial. I love your character on the show because I think she's always the smartest person in the room. As we head into season four, we're looking at all these experiences that Jerry has had with the Waystar Royco family, including being interim CEO. Where does she see herself in the company now? Well, that's a good question because at the end of season three, everything sort of blows up in her face, in, in everyone's face, you know? But she's on the outs with both Logan and Roman, and it's, it's very precarious. Um, so I think that when season four starts, and actually sort of the whole season, there's a feeling of her being in limbo and not really being on firm ground. So I don't know. I mean, I, th I do, I think of her as this, I don't know, as the smartest person in the room too, in a way. And, uh, but I think that she's, she's not a Roy. She does not, she doesn't have the authority to make things go her way. And I don't know that, as I've said before, I don't think she particularly wants to be the, the, on the throne and have the target be on her back. Like I think mm -hmm. she operates best behind the scenes, but I think she sort of doesn't know who her comrades are at the moment, you know? Yeah, I mean, especially it's after that last revelation for Roman, uh, who, yeah. you know, sort of reached out, like, help us. And yeah. Jerry really kind of turned him down. Like, what yeah. What are my interests? You yeah. know? <laughs> <laughs> How does this help me? But, which I tried to teach him to do for himself. So has she cut basically that tether? Their relationship has morphed into many things. But that connection with Roman, what does that look like now? Because, you know, we're all fans of this couple. <laughs> well, I think at the start of the season, it's definitely very, they're very frosty with each other. And Jerry's sort of odd man out in general in the company. But there are a lot of dynamics that keep shifting during the season that Jerry and Roman still have to, so they still have some stuff to go through. I don't know if Jesse agrees with me, but I think that uh, whereas she keeps rebuffing his, his advances, which I don't think he even, 
I don't know what he'd do if, if, if Jerry said, yeah, let's go get a hotel room. I, th I think he'd chicken out, you mm -hmm. know? But I think that, you know, she somehow or another she has affection for him. And maybe just because I have so much affection for Karen, but I feel like he did get under her skin and she really did want a protege and she really did think he'd be a good um, front man for Waystar and she'd be his like, the brains behind the beauty, you know. Um, and I think she's very disappointed about that. And, and so I do think she aches a little bit for him, but she'd never admit it. No, not in a million years. <laughs> not in a million years, exactly. <laughs> you did mention that she is not a Roy and that she is navigating this universe a little bit as an outside, an outside insider. But she is the only other woman besides Shiv that really has that high ranking position. Do you think if she had nurtured Shiv versus Roman, that Shiv might be kind of better? I have thought that many times. I have actually thought that many, many times, but um, I don't think Shiv, um, whatever the psychology is there between Shiv and her mom, or, or, or I'm not sure what it is. I, feel, I don't think, Shiv, I feel like Shiv acknowledges Jerry's um, powers or, or abilities, but she doesn't seem to trust her. And she, so I, but I do think Jerry, I, I mean, I think Jerry's opinion, we've never seen, addressed this in the show, but if, if left to me to answer that, I would say she does notice that Shiv is quite bright, but Shiv is very rash too, and she's, not experienced and she's very judgy so she might not have the the temperance needed i don't know mm -hmm. do you know what i mean but yeah i feel like it's, it's it's the ball would be in shiv's court to to ever start anything like that and it's it's shiv is not very tr trustworthy with her the end end of season three right away after the um phone the text incident uh in italy right away she's trying to get me in trouble with it, you know, for not having reported it to HR. And it's quite ugly and it's, you know, I mean, I love that scene and I loved acting that scene with Sarah. But I feel like Jerry, who always is good at poker face, is like, all she wants to do is end the conversation and get in the ladies' restroom and have a good cry or scream or something, you know? She's yeah. it's so awful that, and you know, many people have told me, even men have told me like, Oh, the women at work say that scene articulated something so familiar and I've never seen it presented on the screen before. Like that that confrontation between two women at work and that miso misogyny between women almost, you know? That, yes, that, that internalized misogyny, yes. absolutely, yes, And that yes. that was, you know, it's a brief scene, but it, a lot of people have pointed that out to me. Women and men have uh, said like, you know, that, that hits, that hit it on, you know, right on the nail, right the nail, right on the on the head there. The other thing that we saw this season was uh, a glimpse of Jerry's personal side. You know, the when she takes a picture of herself to send her daughters. Are we going to see more of that this season? Are we can see more of Jerry's real life. I don't know. Jerry plays everything very close to the vest, and she keeps that stuff pretty private. Um, you you see a little bit of it. Couple more questions. What do you think, Jerry's? Thoughts are on Tom after the season finale. Where does she place him now? I can't answer that. I have to plead the fifth. Uh oh. Uh, okay. <laughs> I can't talk about how I feel about any of them at the end because that would be <laughs> telling. But um, I think she's always thought that Tom got true mercenary ability. He mm -hmm. could be a real soldier, you know, and that he's. But what's so interesting about Tom, and I don't know if Jerry knows this, is just how. Um, the depth he's such a seems like such a shallow character and then the depths of feeling he has about shiv and a lot of people even greg or logan you know he he's he's a really interesting character and i don't know that the others give him credit for that they all treat him like a grown-up frat boy which is kind of you know his outer self jerry's character was completely different when it was scripted and you've even mentioned that Character is only supposed to be in a few episodes. Mm -hmm. You have completely transformed her and made her your own. What was it like the last day on set? I'm going to start crying right now. Uh, it was horrible. We were all sobbing. I mean, it was just we've all had 
this like incredibly rich experience. And you're right, I do feel like this is a unique experience for me. I do feel like I have some ownership over the part and like I really did kind of think her up and to a degree. I mean, the, the, you know, the writers set the, set, set the scene for that and then, but then, and then kind of endorsed what I came up with is how I'd put it and wrote for that. But I do feel like it's just one of those times in a career where you just feel like, so proud of this and this has just been so satisfying to work on and when I watched the premiere last night I was like the show is dazzling in my opinion it's just so beautifully shot and the performances and the the dialogue is so crisp it's like I don't know I mean how, how are you gonna get all those things again I mean it's like the planets have to align you know so everybody's a little sad I mean it's a tight rope walk on a straight razor 500 foot reputational drop. Your character, Connor, is so fascinating to me. And I think it's because of how he positions himself or how they place him in the show. He is a Roy, but he doesn't participate in a lot of the crazy sometimes. But he knows, like, who they are. So, like, at the end of season three, Connor's the only sibling, like, not trying to overthrow Logan. And then at the start of season four, he's the only sibling at the birthday party. How do you think he feels about that and his position within this family? Historically, throughout the show, uh, Connor has always sided with Logan. No matter what the schemes were with, with Kendall or with the other two, he's always uh, come down on the side of his father. Uh, I think that Connor really loves his brothers and his sister, but he doesn't trust them at all. They've used him uh, as sort of a, a, an object of ridicule for all their lives. Uh, he's dismissible, you know, and um, early on, uh, Connor realized he had no aptitude for this cutthroat business stuff, and um, he had a lot of money because the old man set him up, so he didn't have to work. So he divorced himself from that world, and uh, he's, he's basically letting the others pick themselves apart, squabbling and fighting with each other, trying to get control of this empire. And um, when there have been votes, you know, the kids need to vote on something. He's, whatever you guys decide, whatever mm -hmm. you decide, you know. But historically, he's, he's always sided with his father. Um, so that's not a surprise at the beginning of this uh, fourth season that he would be the only one at the birthday party because the, uh, you know, the other three uh, feel absolutely betrayed. And they were, they were betrayed by their mother because she was making a deal for her new husband. Um, and they're just desperate to get their hands on uh, Waystar Royco. Um, and we'll see what happens. But uh, uh, I don't think anything has changed in terms of his feeling toward his father or, or toward the kids. And toward his siblings. Okay. Now, what we did see in the trailer is that we are getting a wedding. So Willa and Connor finally got engaged <laughs> last season, and now we're getting the wedding this season. You've said that Connor sorts, sort of creates his own reality. You know, he's got his own money when it comes to the real world. What reality has he sort of created in his relationship with Willa, and how does it differ from the truth? He's still as entitled and elitist as, as the other kids. He's, he's still, you know, I'm, he just, he has no idea what the real world is. And he's also, he suffers from delusional disorder. He probably, well, it still does have ADHD. He's got a lot of things going on. So he, he has trouble comprehending what real life is. And um, when he was young, the, uh, the divorce happened between Logan and Connor's mother. He was left with his mother probably for 10 years, who was in and out of institutions. He was off at boarding school. So very early on, he created a fantasy world for himself that continues to this day. And the money has always been there to enable that. I don't think Connor really has much of a grasp on what we might call reality. Uh, occasionally, uh, Willa reminds him, even though she's delusional as well, she'll remind him of different things, and it brings him sort of back down to earth a little bit. But he's, um, he's always going to be kind of floating around and, and spiraling. He's not, he's not a grounded person. 
Yeah, no, in, in any way, shape, or form. Exactly. <laughs> also, the boys tend to have some eventful weddings. Will uh, Connors be a spectacle as well? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Without I mean, spoiling it, right? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, Connors' presidential candidacy has been highly entertaining. Could you imagine if he won, though? What no, would I mean, Connor? That would be, that would be the would end of the like? United States as we know it. It, <laughs> it, it. it would be up for grabs, and there would be a coup of some kind. And you know, it might be uh, the military might take over. Who knows? It, it could be you know horrible. Now, I heard through the grapevine that you met an actual president. I, I have a, a friend in Los Angeles. Our kids are, are friends. Her name is Jen Polanzani, and she's a, um, an advanced person for uh, Joe Biden in Los Angeles. And so one day at school, uh, she said, would you like to be in a presidential motorcade? And I was like, yeah, I mean, what do I have to do? And um, she said, what they do is they, uh, they fly the president and a select team of security and military and dignitaries to whatever city he's going to around the world. Um, and then they supplement the drivers with local people. So I wound up uh, being, uh, driving a press van in the motorcade. It was big fun because, um, you know, the motorcycle cops clear the way and you just blow through those streetlights. You just keep moving, man. It's just like stay on the tail of the car in front of you. It's, it's follow the leader. It was a lot of fun. Yeah. Did you actually get to meet him? I did. It was very brief and we had masks on. So, I mean, you know, he was like, good to see you, pal. <laughs> but we couldn't even shake hands because it was still kind of uh, COVID was rampant. So. He had a mask on. I had a mask on. We took a picture. I don't even know where that picture is. That's um, awesome. I was, I was told not to share it with anybody for security reasons. Got you. Connor would, though. Oh, yeah. <laughs> be on, it'd be on uh, Twitter, Instagram, something. <laughs> Um, we were introduced to Justin Kirk's Jared Minkin uh, last season, and it looks like we're seeing more of him this season. What does he bring out of Connor? Oh, jealousy. Uh, uh, he, he raises... Uh, Connor's hackles, I guess you could say, because he uh, he's just a very slick, you know, really intelligent guy with a forceful personality. So he's got a lot of stuff that Connor doesn't have, stuff that Connor covets. Like he walks into a room, Jared Menken walks into a room and people take notice. And uh, Connor would love to have people react to him that way. But um, it's probably never going to happen. Yeah, even with members of his own family, he would well, love no, that. Especially with them. <laughs> um, now, last season, Logan told Kendall that uh, life is a fight for a knife in the mud. Now, well, Connor had a knife, but it was more like a butter knife. <laughs> yeah, it and, absolutely was a butter knife. <laughs> yes. And he waved it in the face of his siblings in the season three finale. Now, juxtaposing that metaphor with the butter knife scene what does that tell you about Connor related to season four? And I know we're not getting beyond this, but what does that tell you about Connor's future? Connor really doesn't possess killer instinct, which all the rest of them have in, you know, in plentitude. So he doesn't really have that. And what you'll, uh, what we've seen throughout these seasons is Connor occasionally stands up to his brothers and sisters and basically tells him to F.O., you know, I've had enough of you, just leave me alone or whatever. He makes a little stand and then he always comes back to them yeah, because he doesn't have anybody else. He has Willa, which is, you know, she was sent from God. God sent Willa to, to Connor, but um, he has no friends. He has no friends. And he, uh, he constantly comes back to his father and to his brothers and his sister because that's all he has. So uh, we've seen him, you know, tell them off and then come, come sort of shuffling back. How you guys doing? <laughs> what was the last day on set like? You've spent so much time with this character. What was that like? It, it was really emotional. Everybody, uh, um, we had two scenes that I was in that day. And uh, in between takes, people were getting very weepy. <laughs> You know, and, um, you know, it, it's because it all meant something and we all love each other. So, you know, uh, when they said it was Justine and Alan's last day, there were 
tears popping and then there's a giant hug of I don't know how many people like this and that was hard to let go. So, you know, but that just means it was real.